In the digital first world, banks and financial services companies need to address the challenges caused by transformation of their businesses, continued regulatory pressures, and increasing security risk. In this next session, you'll hear from David Lochin, a thought leader in the data management and business intelligence, and our very own Henry Tam, Solutions Marketing Manager at Redis, who will share best practices and key customer use cases tied to the banking and financial services industries. David and Henry, please. Hi, my name is David Lotion. I'm the president of Knowledge Integrity, and I'm also the program director for the Master of Information Management program at the University of Maryland. And so let's just kind of jump in. What are we going to talk about today? Here's our agenda. Uh, we're going to talk about key challenges and opportunities that are motivating the need to modernize. We're going to look at technology dependencies and long-term technical debt. Uh, we'll introduce some best practices for data architecture modernization a little bit about what to look for in a modernized data architecture, and then I'm going to hand it off to Henry, who's going to share some Redis Enterprise use cases in a modern data layer. So let's jump right into this. Uh, those of a certain age may uh, recall how consumer banking used to work. Uh, I remember as a kid, I used to go to the uh, branch location of the bank where we kept our accounts. Uh, you'd, fit, you'd visit a physical branch. You'd bring, uh, you know, you'd save up all your transactions. Uh, because you had to bring them to the branch. And so you'd, uh, you'd bundle your transactions and you would bring them, you'd wait in line in a physical location until a teller was available. You would hand all your transactions over to that teller who would then essentially uh, execute those transactions. Sometimes they were they were just kind of bulked up at the, the teller's location to be done and executed later in the day. And you'd hand them a, uh, a physical little, uh, what they call a passbook. They would mark the transaction in your passbook, hand it back to you, you could go home. Uh, but there's limited uh, interactions across different types of services at the bank or different types of products. And so there was limited promotion other than perhaps being some advertisements that are on poster boards that were set up on easels inside the lobby of the bank. Uh, today, uh, it's radically different. Uh, most financial uh, transactions take place electronically. Uh, I've got kids. Uh, my kids have barely ever been in a, in a physical bank location they do most of their transactions through using apps on their phones. And these mobile apps continuously connect consumers to different financial institutions, even networks of financial institutions. The, pro the transactions are processed in real time. They're not being done in batch anymore. And cross-service and cross-product promotion is baked right into the application. And so there's, there's continuous interactions with looking at the customer's profiles to see if there are opportunities for doing those types of promotions. Uh, but in fact, uh, kids of those ages, the millennials uh, and the uh, subsequent generation, their expectations are are really, really different than what the, uh, the baby boomers had expect. Digital natives just have a, an expectation of full cross-institution integration of their apps. Uh, they, they typically don't uh, uh, even communicate using the types of methods that, that that older people would do. So for example, we've got our, our millennials in this picture here, uh, completely integrating, interoperating and communicating by text. Uh, the gentleman on the left says, uh, who wants to go to a concert? They all say that they want to go. He then executes a transaction by making a purchase of the tickets directly through, funded directly from his bank account or through his credit card. Uh, he then notifies everybody that he bought the, uh, the tickets and they all transfer money directly to that individual's bank account through a third party uh, uh, inter uh, uh, interaction network. Uh, so expectations, interactions, behaviors, they're radically different than they were in prior generations. And in fact, digital adoption is, is skyrocketing in Europe. It jumped from 81% to 95% uh, just as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. So, so as, as a byproduct of, of that situation, uh, a significant jump in digital adoption. Uh, so what that suggests is that there are fundamental changes that are going on in the financial industry and in the business, uh, particularly around omni-channel customer experience. So it used to be if you were going to the bank, you were going to a bank. Today, uh, individuals are communicating with banks through multiple channels, not just through a physical location. Uh, as I noted in the prior slide, a lot of the transactions are being executed through networks that are that are kind of hidden from the, the actual consumer. So you can make a 
a transaction. That transaction might actually flow through multiple environments and multiple systems owned by completely different companies uh, that are all inter intercommunicating and interoperating to be able to satisfy those particular needs. Uh, uh, at the same time, you've got uh, new disruptors, fintech disruptors in the industry who are uh, creating new competitive threats to legacy or heritage financial institutions. Uh, you have the need for real-time fraud prevention. Instead of doing detection where you identify it after the fact and then try and chase the, uh, the, uh, the illegal activity, uh, it's much better. It's much better. It's a greater advantage to the financial institution to be able to identify fraud when it is about to happen or prior to its its happening, and be able to to prevent it from uh, transacting instead of actually uh, having to chase it after the fact. Uh, that being said, there's also significant growth in the regulations and laws. In fact, uh, I, I'll, I'll note this again uh, later on. There's over a hundred countries that have data privacy laws. And that's just one area of, of regulatory compliance. Uh, another example is the emerging open banking regulations uh, that are uh, facilitating uh, communication among different financial institutions. Uh, you've got uh, all these growth in volume of transactions and consumers, uh, but they all need to be satisfied in a, in a way that that meets their their uh, response time expectations. So system performance has to be maintained. At a very high level, and of course, in any organization, when there's a a need for some kind of change because there's changes in the business, there's always going to be organizational resistance of changing the underlying infrastructure. And so, uh, these are all different motivating factors that are uh, that have come into play in the financial in uh, industry. Uh, but technology gaps and technology dependencies uh, inhibit the way the business can can evolve to be able to meet these new needs. And so. Uh, you've got technology gaps such as cross-system or cross-platform data accessibility, especially when you've got lines of business that have evolved over time in silos, or even when you've got financial institutions that have grown through acquisition and they've got a number of different subsidiaries, none of whom actually uh, inter uh, intercommunicate. You've got newer platform performance models, such as cloud computing, that differ significantly from the legacy technologies such as the mainframes or the workgroup computing uh, that's typically installed within an organization's data center. Uh, the need to get access to data is critical and getting it on time is, is or, or as quickly as possible is necessary to be able to, to enforce those, those, those response times. And data latency is going to slow the ability to do real-time co customer data integration. Uh, these newer platform operating models are radically different. So the way that, that applications run in a distributed uh, computing environment like the cloud is very different than having uh, transaction processing in batch being done on a mainframe in your data center. Uh, these different siloed systems that I referred to before, uh, sometimes they don't even talk to each other. Sometimes you need to have uh, very sophisticated mechanisms to be able to extract data from one, one system and be able to, to communicate that data with another system. So the bridging of these distributed silo system, systems is very complex. And then you need to navigate the technologies to implement these, these newer needs, such as implementing open banking. Uh, and finally, uh, when you've got an organization that consists of people who are used to one type of technology, you need to raise the awareness and provide training so that uh, your teams will understand how the modern technologies work. And so these are some of the, some of the gaps and dependencies. And what we have is, is five best practices that will help address data architecture modernization challenges. So number one, simplify data accessibility and streamline data integration. Number two, insert an operational data layer to modulate access to legacy systems and emerging systems to modernize without disruption. Number three, integrate execution of data governance and data policy compliance directly into the data layer. Number four, standardize that data layer to improve and essentially encourage data self-service. And number five, ensure that the data layer is optimized for memory and data access. So let's look at this a little more carefully. Uh, if you think about the way uh, the, the modern consumer uh, works, they do much of their interactions through a smart device. Maybe it's through their computer, maybe it's through their phone, uh, but data customer data is created in multiple origination points. So that same cus consumer who, 
who uh, execute a transaction at a physical location or through some kind of point of sale mechanism, data is being logged there. Maybe they, <laughs> excuse me, maybe they had some interactions through through texting with a with a uh, uh, the organization, or maybe they went to a website and they checked their their profile and had a communication through a chat mechanism through the website, or they did credit card transactions or other types of e-commerce. And financial institutions want to be able to get access to all this data and integrate it to be able to, to do the personalization that these consumers expect. So there's a need for embedding capabilities to, to analyze a coherent and consistent view of customer data that's pulled from all the different points where the data is being created and stored. And so this can be very slow if you're accessing this data on on demand. Uh, instead, if you can use a data layer, which is similar to what we have uh, on the slide, it can speed access, it can support integration, and, and ultimately reduce data latency, which is one of the key issues uh, that, that are Im impeding the ability to provide these real-time uh, consumer uh, uh, experience and personalization, et cetera. Uh, our second practice, an operational data layer modulates access to legacy and emerging systems. And so if you think about it, financial services back office systems are typically on-premises data center mainframes, and all the interactions or transactions are being facilitated through through uh, the, the interactions with that mainframe computer. And uh, you can think about modernizing the mainframe, uh, but instead of uh, you know buying bigger and, and, and uh, larger uh, hardware that you install inside your own data center. A lot of organizations are looking at the cloud as being a, a good alternative or even a, a desired alternative to, to capital acquisition of, of big iron. And so a lot of organizations are looking at transforming to a multi-cloud platform. Well, when you want to transform your, your, your infrastructure to a multi-cloud platform, you have to recall that you have to be able to make sure that your app applications continue to work the way they're expected to work. And so one of the mechanisms that we can suggest is implementing a high-performance microservices layer between the consuming applications and the source of the transaction processing. So a high-performance integrated microservices and data layer can essentially modulate access to the legacy system. And what it does is it gives you a mechanism for transitioning without, without uh, disruption. And so once you've, you've reformulated or refactored your applications to communicate with the back office through that, that uh, uh, data layer, uh, you can actually change your underlying system uh, without, without disrupting the way those, those applications make use of that data. So it gives you uh, a position to support increasing number of third-party apps and stream processing while continuing to satisfy the needs of existing applications. Uh, our next best practice is integrating data policy governance and compliance directly into that data layer. So increasing there's an increasing array of governance directives, data quality directives, regulatory compliance, legal compliance directives that need to be addressed simultaneously in real time. So it's not just that I've got a bunch of data privacy laws, for example, uh, and I have to I have to check compliance with a a, a single data privacy law, but rather, I've got a, if I'm a global financial institution, I've got consumers across the world. I need to make sure that at any point, at any location that that individual is making a transaction, that that all of the compliance directives are being observed at the same time, and that becomes relatively complex and it's difficult to manage. So, an operational data layer can be configured to directly embed integrated validation and compliance monitoring. So, when it comes to things like know your customer or anti-money laundering or FATCA or GDPR or any, any of the privacy policies that are, are continuing to be piled on, uh, instead of having to be concerned that, that your systems implement that at numerous locations across the enterprise, that you actually can embed that directly into that, uh, that operational data layer. Uh, think about the, uh, the scope and scale of, of, uh, consumer interactions. I mean, we've got myriads of consumers that are executing potentially millions of requests concurrently, transactions, et cetera, uh, that they want to be able to look at their account. They want to be able to see what's going on. They want to be able to compare what's going on in one account with another account. 
Uh, and this data is sitting all over the place. Uh, if the bank is instituting some kind of barrier or gateway in between, it uh, it becomes a bottleneck. And so you have to get out of the way. And one of the ways to do that is to make use of, of uh, APIs and microservices that connect the uh, the entity or the app directly to the sources of that data. So it 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 the these apps that require access to consumer data have a secure means of of requesting and transmitting that data. So the microservices on the institution side service those requests, and you've got APIs that are sitting between the consumers and these microservices that are navigating the authentication and authorization to make sure that that the individual is the, the right one who to be able to get access to the particular accounts and that the the the, the that individual is in, only given the information that is authorized to be displayed so the APIs are being used to authenticate and validate and and, and execute those requests uh, and then finally optimizing the data layer for memory and data access uh, in-memory architectures are robust enough to be able to support transaction processing, operational processing, and analytical processing simultaneously. And so this creates an opportunity where, where uh, instead of having to, to execute a transaction and then trying to formulate a consumer profile by pulling data out of uh, storage, we can make use of an in-memory architecture that can maintain a consistent view of that consumer's interactions and the consumer's profile that is that essentially cached in memory and is only updated when there's a change in the underlying system. So if you go back to what I was suggesting earlier about how there's an omni-channel interaction and an expectation of consistency across uh, those those different the the, pers the perspectives. If I've got copies of that profile information that are managed by my data layer uh, and and it's maintained consistently because it, it it monitors for any kind of underlying changes. It means that I've got a, a essentially an elimination of of the uh, data latency of running a request to pull data from its other sources. So this in-memory architecture is actually nicely suited to cloud deployment because it provides automated scaling, it does on-demand elasticity, and it's replicable uh, and can be containerized across multiple cloud service providers. So I can actually deploy this mechanism for doing an in-memory architecture, uh, and if if it, it make use of the elasticity of the cloud uh, service providers by expanding or contracting as demand uh, uh, grows or shrinks, and doing that also in real time. So I'm I'm actually got a a, a an optimal mechanism for both uh, ensuring that that uh, uh, requests are being serviced in a reasonable time frame, but also that I'm not overwhelming my costs because I have uh, capabilities that I'm paying for, but not actually using. So it does give you a, a number of different benefits there. So here's some considerations. There are some, some uh, 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 new changes in the financial services industry uh, that create new opportunities. And yet, legacy or heritage organizations that rely on legacy systems are going to have a diminished capability for competing as new competitors and disruptors emerge in a fast-changing world. Uh, modernization affords this opportunity to eliminate the technologies dependence, technology dependencies that we talked about, and essentially pay down that technical debt. Uh, if we look at our best practices for data architecture modernization, uh, it actually depends directly on adopting an operational data layer. Uh, and if you are going to look at employing an operational data layer, look at technologies that enable your organization to modernize without disruption, to be able to do so without making significant changes to the way the underlying existing applications work, yet provide you with a, a short runway to be able to adopt uh, new technologies and new capabilities and build new New competencies that uh, improve your customers' experience, and so I'm going to I'm going to uh, hand it off to Henry. Henry's going to uh, uh, provide some examples of some Redis Enterprise use cases for an enterprise uh, data layer. Thank you, David. My name is Henry Tan. I'm the Senior Solutions Marketing Manager at Redis, with a focus on industry vertical solutions, including financial services. 
Today, I wanted to share a couple of key Redis use cases in the modern data layer. First, I want to cover four key capabilities that makes Redis Enterprise the ideal real-time modern data platform for the next generation of financial services applications. First, Redis Enterprise is built on open source Redis and can deliver sub-millisecond responses to deliver those instant customer experiences that David was alluding to earlier. Second, we have the flexibility to build and scale modern applications based on our support for multiple data structures and models, including Redis JSON, Search, Graph, and Time Series. Third, Redis Enterprise can be deployed on-premise as a self-managed service or in the cloud as a fully managed service through our partnerships with AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud. Fourth and most importantly, Redis Enterprise with its 99.99% uptime is enterprise hardened to meet those mission critical needs. Many financial services customers are deploying Redis Enterprise in their production deployments today. Customers like PayPal, MasterCard, ED Bank, and Deutsche Force. Redis Enterprise key use cases fall into four key buckets or areas. First is customer client experience, risk management, real-time fraud protection, reporting, and analytics. The key thread between all four use cases is the need for real-time data. The first use case I'm really excited to share. This is a top 10 bank in North America, and they wanted to deliver a, a unique and differentiated customer experience. So the use case is that to be able to provide customers and clients with their consolidated account and balance information um, instantly. I think the key word there is instantly without having to wait as we're sometimes accustomed to for that hourglass or waiting for something to load. So how does it work? So during the process where the customer is logging into their mobile app, into the their banking website, we have already started to detect who they are through their user and device ID. And in the background, the necessary account information is being prefetched and loaded into Redis um, Enterprise. This enabled us to deliver that instant seamless experience that this bank wanted to deliver. By having that data already basically organized, the data already modeled and formatted, uh, based on that user interface, we're able to deliver that instant experience that customers demand and require in today's um, all digital world. So the technical solution is Redis Enterprise as a front-end database with our JSON module to deliver that instant customer experience. The second use case is really interesting um, as well. A lot of uh, financial institutions and banks are moving to what's called a zero trust model. And a zero trust model's key fa uh, facet or principle is to be able to allow or deny access to APIs, data, or resources for each and every request. As you can imagine, this is going to drive up the scale and the volume of those API requests, for example. If you think about a open banking scenario where a bank has to share some customer information with a third party partner. Um, all that request has to come to the API gateway and be allowed. And you may only want to allow specific sets of data based on some attribute or fields. Um, because you don't want to share, you know, all the data. You only want to provide the data that's specifically required. The other thing that's key here is that the implementation of an attribute-based access control model, ABAC. This allows even finer grain policy decisions and policy enforcement as part of an OAuth-based identity management solution that this particular bank was implementing. Attribute-based access control really means that you are really getting to the attributes that control specific fields or resources uh, to that API uh, to provide that fine-grain control. And this really improves both not only the customer, in this case, the third-party um, application, but the end customer as well. And it also improves the developer experience because you're able to 
provide that fine grain access control um, to the uh, developer to secure access to that data. And with Redis Enterprise Active Active for high performance and a globally distributed uh, ABAC database, we're able to enable that access control uh, for any client or customer across the globe uh, with high availability. And the key here is that the performance that's necessary for this kind of access control model is only going to be possible with an in-memory data platform like Redis Enterprise. So the technical solution is Redis Enterprise acting as the primary database to store the tokens, the identity, the permissions, and the rule sets for this fine-grained access control in an active, active geo-distributed database. The next use case involves improving the case management experience and reporting. This leading financial services customer was developing their own in-house case management tool. And one of their goals was to improve the efficiency and productivity of their investigators as they were doing their due diligence to determine whether fraud was happening or whether it was money laundering, et cetera. One of the things that they needed Redis Enterprise to provide was the ability to do an in-memory search. And the key here is that if the data and related case files and documents and data needed by these investigators were stored in a some sort of persistent storage solution, then it would have needed to be encrypted and would have slowed down the search process. So Redis Enterprise using its Redis search module was able to provide fast and efficient in-memory search for discrete fields, for terms across multiple cases that may have been related, and then enable them to find patterns that might indicate that fraud or money laundering was in fact occurring. Another component of this solution, as you'll see in the diagram, is called Redis Connect. Redis Connect provides the change data capture framework and connector that allowed us to be able to um, extract and collect the updates from the backend SQL relational database. That way we were you know, up to date with all the latest uh, files and data needed by the case investigators. So overall, the technical solution was Redis Enterprise acting as a in-memory data store using the fast Redis search capabilities and then the change data capture of Redis Connect. I wanted to share a specific um, case study that we have done with uh, one of our key customers in Europe, Deutsche Börse. Deutsche Börse is a leading international securities exchange um, company that operates and it's headquartered in Germany. They were facing scalability issues as the volume of trades and the reporting that they had to do to their regular regulators. So their scholarship boards turned to Redis Enterprise to offer real-time trade reporting services to their 3,000 plus clients um, and was able to support a 20x expansion in message volume with no increase in latency. Um, so basically their quote and trade events which were captured in CAFTA were being sent to Redis Enterprise for processing before being stored in the Oracle database. So the key benefit that we provided for Deutsche Boards was be, you know, enable them to do these rapid data transmissions, uh, meet their uh, regular compliance requirements and effortlessly scale um, and to provide those growing amounts of quote and trade volumes as their business grew. A great quote from uh, Maja Shrav, the head of data IT was that Redis Enterprise supports the throughput and latency requirements Deutsche Boss was re is required to guarantee to its regulators and to its customers. A again, mission critical application. This is the key um, application and requirements for their business. And Redis Enterprise was able to provide and support them in their scalability and low latency. Thank you, and David and I will be more than happy to take further questions, as I know we went through some of these use cases um, fairly quickly. Thank you. Great to hear how organizations can modernize their data layer without disruption with Redis's real-time data platform to not only power blazing fast mobile apps, 
but also build zero-touch security model and open banking to compete against cloud-native fintech disruptors.